Okay. So thank you everyone for calling in for this um, school-based health center, those patient-centered primary care homes, um, an overview of the PCPCH program. Um, I'm Kate O'Donnell with the Oregon School-Based Health Center State Program Office, and I'm very pleased um, to have uh, Chris Carrera from the Patient-Centered uh, patient Primary Care Home Program at the Oregon Health Authority joining us. Um, a couple of objectives that we're hoping to achieve uh, during this webinar, first of all, just to provide an overview of the PCPCH program, to provide a brief summary of the uh, application process. Um, to provide a summary of um, what to expect during a site visit, so the verification visit from the PCPCH program. Then to review some of the program's must-pass measures um, with an emphasis on measures that um, the PCPCH, PCPCH program um, often hears questions about. Um, and then kind of at the end we'll do a discussion of what the benefits are of participating in the PCPCH program. And then um, we will also reserve time at the end for additional questions if we don't get to your question um, during the actual webinar. So I'm going to just go ahead and introduce our presenter and then turn it over to Chris. So Chris Carrera is a practice enhancement specialist or a practice coach with the Patient-Centered Primary Care Home Program, or PCPCH. Chris has worked in healthcare since 1998 his roles have included delivering direct patient care as an LPN and EMT in family medicine, urgent care, emergency medicine, outpatient surgery, and medical surgical oncology units, EPIC analyst for oncology and ambulatory clinics, quality improvement coordination, and clinic manager positions. Chris has a Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Management and a Master of Public Administration. Chris cultivated his passion for high-quality, patient-centered healthcare while providing quality improvement and project management support for a medical home pilot program with a local medical group in the state of Oregon. As a practice coach with the Oregon Health Authority's Patient-Centered Primary Care Home Program, Chris participates in site visits throughout the state and um, provides practice support to help clinics meet PCPCH standards and improve patient care. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Great. Thanks, Kate. And thank you, everyone, on the phone listening in. I appreciate your time. And um, I hope that this webinar will be of benefit to you. So as Kate mentioned, um, I will do my best to kind of leave natural breaks in the presentation throughout so you can um, jump in with your questions. And also keep in mind, at the end of the presentation, we have carved out some time for you um, to ask questions as well. So I'll go ahead and start with uh, an overview of the program and um, we'll go from there. So the, the PCPCH recognition criteria are defined by six core attributes with specific standards within each attribute and then corresponding measures that indicate the extent to which a clinic is meeting a particular standard. Um, as Kate mentioned, some measures are must pass and are required in order to be recognized by the PCPCH program. And there are 10 of those that we will talk about in more detail later in the presentation. And the remaining measures in the program are optional. And uh, the more standards and measures that you meet, uh, the more points you will get on your recognition and the higher tier level. Um, but as I mentioned, only 10 of those measures are actually must pass in order to be recognized by the program. It is a tiered model with a large degree of flexibility. Clinics have options to receive points for doing many of the things they are actually already doing. Um, and when we go on site visits, we do talk about that as well. Um, so next slide, please. And also, I did want to mention and give credit where credit is due here. Um, so a lot of these slides are portions of other presentations that um, my teammates have put together as well. And I've added some new ones for us today specifically. Uh, pertaining to school-based health centers. Um, but we have a great team in the PCPCH program that I have the honor of working with, and I'm hoping that you get to interact with them in the coming months and years if you um, are already recognized or you plan to be recognized in the near future. So in the previous slide, there was an illustration of the core attributes kind of in a visual sense with a house um, with a house, and so that was just kind of a 
a snapshot to give you a visual. This slide here kind of lists them out line by line ex exactly what those attributes are and what we mean by them. Uh, so the first one, the first core attribute of the program is access, access to care. And so one of the things that we often share with clinics when we go on a site visit is you can have all these really wonderful processes in place and a, and a fantastic healthcare team, but if your patients can't get to you, then that doesn't help them. So one of the things we do really uh, like to emphasize is um, access. And so one example of that would be um, aside from a routine visit would be something like what do patients do after hours if they need to get in touch with someone? How do they get help when the clinic is closed and that sort of thing? So that would be another example of access or maybe a patient portal would be a different type of access. So when we define these terms, um, we, do, we tend to define them a little more broadly than just um, an, a regular office visit because there are various ways to access care. So accountability is the next core attribute. And one of the, the primary things we look at here is, um, so clinics are doing all this great work, but how do you know that what you're doing is having an impact? So a lot of what we talk about in the accountability standard has to do, or standards has to do with measurements, um, quality improvement initiatives, actually measuring the action you're taking and seeing if it's having an impact on your patients. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the third core attribute of the program is comprehensive whole person care. So this has to do with things like um, mental health screening, substance abuse screening. Are we caring for people as a whole person as opposed to maybe just the, the concrete physical things that are going on, but are we considering other aspects um, of your patients as people that are affecting their health? Um, and it's broader than just kind of the mental health and substance abuse, but that's a, a kind of a concrete uh, example that we, we tend to talk about. And I'll touch on that later. So continuity of care is the next core attribute. So what we mean by continuity is, um, as opposed to when you come for a visit at your clinic, um, are you just seeing who is, whoever is available? because that's who has a slot in their schedule that day, and maybe you're seeing a different provider every single time you go to the doctor, um, which is, has been shown to not be good for, for patient outcomes, but um, actually an emphasis on do you have a particular care team that knows who you are over time, and, and do you get to be in touch with those people on a routine basis? And it doesn't necessarily mean you see one specific provider every time, but uh, kind of a handful of people that really know you, um, and, and can get to know you over time. And I'll explain what that is a little bit more later. So coordination and integration is the next core attribute. Um, so one example of what we mean by this is uh, like referral coordinations would be a great example that we run into quite a bit on site visits. Um, so if your provider writes a referral order for you and you need to go see a specialist, um, how does that process work? Um, how do they facilitate that happening safely and efficiently for you as a patient? And so if a referral order is written, and do they know if you went to that specialist? Do they know what the specialist did for you? Um, or did they kind of lose track and not pay attention after they wrote the referral? So that would be kind of a prime example of what we mean by uh, coordination of care. And then the last core attribute is person and family-centered care. Um, and again, there are various measures within each attribute, but one of the kind of important ones is um, are clinics asking patients what they think of the care they get there? Um, are they seeking input? Um, so that can be done in a variety of ways, but um, surveys are actually obviously one of the big ones. Um, and another kind of key aspect of person family centered care is uh, language, you know, patient's primary language, do they receive uh, materials and are they communicated with uh, in a way that they understand. So next slide, please. Uh, a little bit ago I mentioned the different tier levels, so I'll give you a little bit of background on that. Um, the Oregon Health Authority convened the first standards advisory committee to develop what a primary care home would look like in Oregon. The committee looked to other national and state models and felt that while each of those models had some good components, 
It didn't accurately, accurately reflect, reflect what all the stakeholders felt true patient-centered care should look like in Oregon. One of the key purposes for convening the group and developing the Oregon PCPCH model was so that there could be one set of standards that could be used across stakeholders and payers for defining this kind of care. The committee developed a model defined by six core attributes, as shown in the previous slides, each with a number of corresponding standards and measures. It is a tiered model similar to the NCQA PCMH model, with Tier 1 having foundational structure and processes in place, and Tier 3 being a more robust PCPCH that can very proactively manage their patient population. And as you can see, there's just a breakdown on uh, what point levels take you into which tier. Next slide, please. So where are PCPCHs? So currently, over 500 clinics in the state of Oregon are recognized as PCPCH, and we also actually have one in Vancouver, Washington. Um, PCPCHs can be found in 34 of Oregon's 36 counties. About 35% of them are located in areas considered to be rural and 65% are located in areas considered to be urban. Uh, PCPCHs are not like finding Waldo. There are lots of clinics doing this work on a regular basis. If you are already PCPCH recognized or are considering it, there are many folks on the same journey, and our job in the PCPCH program is to help you along that journey. And a little shout out to Meg Bowen, one of my teammates who uh, threw Waldo in there. I really like that. So. <laughs> Thanks, Meg. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I mentioned the 10 must-pass measures. Here they are, and I will describe a, a little more detail about what these are. Um, so I did mention those a little bit ago. Um, one of the things to keep in mind for a lot of the measures is that you need to be able to calculate about 12 months worth of data when the measure requires data. Um, and again, if you find yourself in a situation where maybe you don't have that much historical data, uh, we can kind of take that on a case-by-case -case basis and see if there is um, something that can be done to, to measure accurately what we're trying to get at with a given measure. As you can see, there is at least one must-pass measure for each core attribute of the program. Uh, for example, core attribute one being access and the corresponding must-pass measure having to do with access to advice via phone uh, 24 hours per day. I'll talk about that uh, later as well. So over the next few minutes, I will highlight five of these must-pass measures that frequently generate questions. And I will also be happy to help answer any additional questions you might have about them. So do we have any questions right now? I think we might have one coming in. So we have a question from Amy Harris. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to know, uh, she said SDHCs can submit six months of data instead of uh, 12 months per program director, Nicole. There we go. Correct. So, so that's the next question. Right. Yeah, no, you're fine. No, that's correct. So the school-based health centers, I don't know if you're able to hear that. So the school-based health centers can submit six months of data as opposed to 12 months. So we can work with you on that aspect of it. So the first must-pass measure is 1C0, and as I mentioned, it's the PCPCH provides continuous access to clinical advice by telephone. So um, one of the important things for our patients or for patients at any clinic is, you know, when the clinics close, it's also important that they still receive access to clinical advice and primary care outside of normal hours, um, partly because that's the patient's medical home, but also because um, we also think it's important that patients end up, don't end up going to the ER or urgent care kinds of facilities um, for things that aren't necessary. Um, it's hard for the patient, it's hard on the system, um, and it's just much better patient care to be available when possible. So a couple things uh, that can work in order to meet this measure are um, you can hire an answering service to triage your calls for you and route them to the appropriate provider on call. Uh, another option is 
providers can just be on call and have a direct phone line that patients can call them on, and they have a shared rotation when they're on call, or some sort of a nurse triage line. But the key here is the patients need to be able to get in touch with a live person um, 24 hours a day. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, the second must pass measure is 3C0, and this falls under the comprehensive whole person care attribute. Um, this measure is frequently misunderstood by a variety of organizations, so I thought it would be important to touch on it here. What we look for in this measure is a clinic-wide strategy for the use of standardized screening. Oftentimes what we see happening at sites is that screeners are utilized on a chief complaint-driven basis as the patient comes in for a specific issue, uh, so the clinic ends up screening for that issue, or the provider suspects a particular thing may be a problem in a patient's life, such as alcohol or drugs, um, and then the screener is used. Or some providers within the same practice screen for certain things, while others screen very little or not at all. So in that instance, there's no real strategy for screening, and it's performed on an ad hoc basis. But what we're really going for with this particular measure is proactive population-wide screening. So some examples would be every patient gets screened for depression on a periodic basis, or every patient gets screened for alcohol and substance abuse a specific number of times per year, and also every provider in the clinic uses the screeners per the determined clinic-wide strategy. And I think that's often the piece that's missing. Um, we get a lot of providers that are kind of doing their own thing, but there's no overarching strategy in the clinic to catch these things. Uh, and one really brief real-life example that um, uh, one of our clinical transformation consultants, which is a physician that goes on the site visits with us, and I'll explain what that is a little bit more later, um, but one of the examples that he often shares is, um, you know, he always thought that patients would just tell them if something was wrong and they would be comfortable sharing with them whatever was going on, and so they didn't need to, to always ask necessarily. And so one time a patient of his came in, and um, they handed him an actual uh, screening, and I believe it was a depression screening. And so he filled out the paper in the waiting area and brought it in and went to his appointment, and um, the patient expressed to the provider that um, he said thank you for giving me permission to talk about this. I didn't know that I could come to you with this kind of stuff. So, and we hear that quite a bit, um, providers at clinics saying that their patients feel comfortable telling them anything. Um, and that might be true some of the time, but uh, this particular patient didn't know he could do that until he was told he could do that. So um, this is another reason this particular measure is very important. Okay, next slide. So the next must-pass measure has to do with continuity, and it is 4E0, and so the PCPCH has a written agreement with its usual hospital providers or directly provides routine hospital care. So this measure focuses on the importance of effectively overseeing and managing transitions of care between inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, and one of the things I, I do share with clinics is, as opposed to being a legal or business document, it's really more of a logistical plan between the clinic and the hospital. Uh, it just puts it in writing. It's kind of a who's on first discussion, really. Uh, and so its purpose is to specify in writing how entities will coordinate care and communicate with one another. So the main components we're looking for in a hospital or a, a hospital agree agreement, um, there are four main pieces of it. And the first one is a process for requesting hospital admission. So for example, when someone needs to be admitted, what number needs to be called to initiate the admission? Uh, how does one go about obtaining the admission in the first place? Uh, the second component is process and performance expectations for communication at the time of admission. So for example, if I'm a primary care provider and someone else started the process of admitting one of my patients, how would I know they've been admitted? Um, how will medical records be shared at the time of admission? How will I be informed of daily assessments and tests and those kinds of things that are ordered uh, for a given patient? 
The third component on the hospital agreement is um, process and expectations at the time of discharge. So if I'm a provider, how will I know when my patient has been discharged? And then the fourth component of this is um, how do we coordinate care after the discharge? So follow-up appointments and those kinds of things. And it's really just making sure people are paying attention to what's happening to the patient and that the handoff happens safely and smoothly, smoothly for the patient. Okay, and the, um, the last must-pass measure, measures we'll describe are, have to do with continuity as well, 4A0 and 4B0. So 4A0 shows how many of a given clinic's patients have a designated primary care provider documented. Uh, so 4A0 simply requires that a practice reports the percent of PCP assignment. There is no benchmark for 4A0. So um, what, we're just, what we're doing with this one is just making sure clinics have a way to document and report on how many of their patients actually have someone assigned in their chart as their PCP. And so you might actually be surprised um, how many clinics we go to that don't actually know how many patients go to their clinic uh, and how many providers don't know how many people are on the panel. So I know it sounds like a very simple one, but this is actually a, a fairly big conversation piece when we do visit sites. Um, and it does help the clinic start to think about you know, what exactly their patient population is and how to go about um, measuring that. So 4B0 is related, but it's a different measure. So this one shows out of a given clinic's total office visits, for a specific period of time, what percent of those visits were appointments where patients uh, saw their own primary care provider? So the first one just measures is the PCP assigned. The second one measures are how often are people actually seeing their own provider as opposed to um, seeing somebody else. Okay. So those are, oh, one more thing on, on the 4A0 and 4B0. Um, one question that does come up is, do we need an electronic health record in order to do this? So the answer is no, you do not. Um, for those people or those sites that do not have an electronic health record, you can do a manual chart audit of 30 charts for each of these measures, um, and that would be sufficient for us to verify uh, whether or not you need these measures. Um, now certainly EMRs can make it easier, but um, we didn't want to exclude people who don't have those, um, so I think it's important that we work with folks and uh, make sure they can still meet these measures. So I'm going to break right here about the must-pass measures and see if we have any questions. Yeah, we have one question. Um, it says, can process for admission be that the patient reports to the emergency room? Uh, admitting rights are quite complicated and not feasible, really, for small clinics with PAs and limited staff. Okay. So, can you read that one more time for us? Sure. Um, it says, can process for admission be that the patient reports to the emergency room? Uh, question mark. Uh, admitting rights. Admitting rights are quite complicated and not feasible, really, for small clinics with PAs and limited staff. So following emergency room admission, there would be communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, that's a good question. So if I understand it correctly, um, it, it sounds like you're asking more about the, uh, the process itself. Um, and what we're going for in Measure 4E0 is more about the the two healthcare entities that are involved in the process, so the, the hospital to which, the hospital or ER to which the patient gets admitted, and then their primary care provider. Now the process can be whatever it, it needs to be for the two entities and the patient. What we're really wanting for 4E0 is to have that in writing. So as long as the two organizations involved have it in writing how the process is going to work out, and if that works for you guys, uh, then that's fine. And, and so not every hospital agreement is going to look the same. Um, as long as it's outlined who's doing what for the patient to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. Um, and so I hope that answers your question. And I would be happy also to, to follow up 
uh, more on that at the end of this or offline in person on the phone, I'd be happy to do that as well. Okay, so next slide. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the application process. So it's just a very high level overview for you. Um, there's a technical assistance guide. So the first thing um, that is probably best to do would be to gain familiarity with the process itself by reviewing the technical assistance guide. Um, and it's on our website, tcpch.org. And um, this will provide you with an in-depth information regarding the technical aspects of the application process as well as an explanation of the PCPCH program standards and requirements. So I provided you very high level overviews of some of the measures, but the TA guide is very in-depth, uh, lots of detail, and um, we are also happy to answer questions about that once you dig into it. After you review the TA guide and get familiar with the program, the next step would be to do a self-assessment, which is also available and on our site, and it will help the team gauge if it is ready to proceed with the application and an eventual site visit. We do plan to visit every PCPCH recognized clinic in the state of Oregon, and right now we have about 500 plus. So it'll take a bit, but we'll get there eventually. Um, we're working on it. Um, the next step after you do a self-assessment is to email us. So after you gain familiarity with the TA guide and do the self-assessment, send us an email to the address shown in the slide to have an account created for your clinic. We have an actual live person who monitors the team inbox routinely and she will help answer questions you might have about the program and the application process. So if you have specific questions, feel free to reach out to us with those. After you have an account created, go ahead and complete and submit the application online. After you submit it, your application will be reviewed for completeness. After it is confirmed that your application is complete, you will be listed as a PCPCH recognized site with the state of Oregon. A site visit is not required prior to being recognized. The site visit comes after um, you apply and have your application confirmed, which brings us to the next section of our webinar. All right, so after you do apply and get recognized, um, at some point you will be selected for a site visit. So sites are selected via a randomized method, um, but as I mentioned, we do plan to visit every site in the coming years. We do our best to give practices about six weeks notice regarding their upcoming visit and we'll work with you and your teams to prepare for the visit. We also like to schedule a 30-minute telephone call within a week or so of you receiving the notification that you've been selected. And the purpose of the call is really just to get the process started, begin planning the agenda, and answer any questions you might have. And we enjoy answering questions, so don't feel shy or embarrassed. Um, also, just as a heads up, um, because we often hear this at the end of a site visit, so I thought it'd be good to say this up front, uh, we don't penalize people for asking questions ahead of time. Um, so if you have workflows you have questions about or any other issues and maybe things aren't super pretty at your clinic and you have a question that, about something you're working on, um, feel free to ask us about any of those things. Um, ask us about the site visit, the measures, anything at all. Um, we're happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, so the purpose of the site visit is uh, threefold. Uh, so they're for verification, assessment, and collaboration. So we do need to verify that the things clinics attested to doing are actually happening um, for the purpose of maintaining the integrity of the program. Um, also, when we go on site visits, we like to assess uh, what kind of neat, innovative things are happening and also uh, to gather people's great ideas and best practices and share those with other clinics as well that might be able to benefit from them. So when we go on a site visit, we might learn some great things from your site, and because we've gone on previous site visits prior to yours, um, we like to share that learning with you as well. Uh, and then also after the site visit, we remain available to continue partnering with you, and I'll talk a little bit more about that piece later. And then certainly uh, collaboration. We're here to support you. Um, however, we are able to help you with any of your uh, improvement goals. So, Oh, and that little graphic on the bottom right. So that is, uh, it's like 
so innovation is like trying to drive a, a car and change the wheel at the same time. And uh, so we like to uh, kind of throw little pictures in there. Well, we have Waldo so far, Price is Right, and uh, whatever those guys are doing there. So, all right, next slide, please. Okay, so who comes to your clinic during a site visit? So one of the roles, or one of the people that will be on the site visit team is called a, a site visitor. Uh, and this person reviews and verifies that you're meeting the standards primarily through reviewing documentation and asking questions of staff members. Another team member is the practice enhancement specialist or practice coach, um, which is my role. Uh, this person verifies more of the functionality of the measures uh, you attested to and assists with uh, technical assistance and or follow-up after the site visit. And then the third person on a site visit team is what we call clinical transformation consultants, and these are physicians. And so we also bring them along uh, on the visit with us. They provide the clinical perspective of PCPCH transformation work and assist with verification and functionality of clinic standards. Um, and so, well, I'll get, that, I'll get to that second part later. I was going to talk, I was going to jump into post-site visit, but we're going to cover that in just a little bit. So those are the three people that are on a site visit. And um, next slide, please. Oh, I did need to cover that. Actually, we can go back one slide. Let's do that. Thank you very much. So um, I wanted to touch a little bit on the um, post-site visit support. So the practice enhancement specialist and the clinical transformation consultant are available to the sites that they have visited for a period of up to six months. And the assistance can range from anything as simple as asking us questions about what we really meant, what we said when we said when we were at the site visit, uh, clarifying measures, some things like that. Or um, we've done things uh, up to taking uh, folks to visit other clinics and observe workflows there. We've had uh, one clinic in particular that heard that a different clinic was using uh, medical assistance as uh, scribes in the exam room during visits, and they wanted to see that in action. So we facilitated um, them doing a site visit of their own and uh, shadowing folks at that clinic throughout the day. Um, so, and we're happy to do all of those things. It's, it's really as much as you want to pull on us uh, based on what your goals are for your clinic. And also technical assistance with tools and templates uh, of different things you might be working on, like care plans, um, hospital agreement templates, and those kinds of things. OK, next slide. OK, and what will a site visit look like? So we do have uh, an agenda template that's pretty standard um, in how we organize our site visits. And if anyone would like to see that, you can do that as well. There might actually be one in our technical assistance guide. So um, a few of the main sections of the site visit day, um, we do an initial kickoff meeting at the very beginning of the day. So this involves clinic leadership and whomever clinic leadership would like to have in the room during the kickoff. And that's maybe, uh, I think it's 45 minutes to an hour about. And so that's really to get a sense of um, the history of the clinic, uh, what prompted them to go down the PCPCH journey, um, challenges, successes, and those sorts of things. And also, obviously, we, we do introductions and we tell everyone a little bit about our own background as site visitors and uh, that sort of thing. So also, there are two separate interviews of a uh, provider and medical assistant dyad team. So we do two of those. And um, so the practice enhancement specialist and the clinical consultant both interview those two teams. And also, we interview, if, if this role exists at the clinic, anyone that's fulfilling the behavioral health and or care coordination functions in the clinic. We do an interview of a patient, uh, a patient focus group, and um, that they're the whole reason we're there. So we really like to hear from them, and we take that feedback from the interviews, and we do share that with the clinic. And then also, the um, site visitor uh, 
person I mentioned, that role that I mentioned earlier, uh, the one that is uh, kind of digging into the documentation, asking questions of the staff members there, and really getting a picture of how they're doing what they're doing as well. And then at the end of the day, or towards the end of the day, the site visit team uh, compares notes, they have a discussion, and they, they determine whether or not the uh, clinic's meeting certain measures, and then we do a report out at the very end. Um, so there aren't any surprises. So at the end of the site visit day, the clinic knows exactly uh, the measures, that, if any, that would need follow-up, um, and then how to get help from us um, to help them meet those, those goals. Okay, any questions about the site visit itself? Okay, looks like we'll move on. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we've learned so far um, with the program. So much like all of you are continually working toward improvement, we are doing the same within our own team. So along those lines, program evaluation is underway for the PCPCH program. And here are a few of the things that we've discovered. 85% of respondents, uh, oh, let me back up. So these are surveys of PCPCH recognized sites. So 85% of respondents felt the PCPCH model increased the quality of care they were providing to their patients. 75% felt the model improved access to service. 85% felt it improved the individual experience of care in the practice. And 82% felt the model improved population health management. And a 2013 report from the Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation, QCOR, found that PCPCHs had higher mean scores for several indicators compared to non-PCPCH clinics, including monitoring in diabetics, and well child physics. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so I wanted to share a little bit with you about the benefits of participating in the PCA, PCPCH program. And these are um, pieces of feedback that we've actually gotten from clinics themselves um, during and after site visits. So one of the things is it provides a framework for improvement efforts. Um, one of the things we hear quite frequently throughout the state as we do our visits is that um, it provides a structure for clinics and teams um, on how to go about doing this kind of work. So there are so many potential aspects of care to focus on and an endless number of methods to employ. And so the question is, where do you start? Um, so the PCPCH affords private, public, small, and large organizations, a way to think about the work conceptually, specific goals to reach, and a program structure to support the efforts. So there's no reinventing the wheel. And it allows flexibility for each practice's unique patient population, team makeup, and available resources. Uh, one of the other benefits is the sharing of best practices. So we at the PCPCH team love to steal good ideas and share them. We are collectors of sorts, so if we hear about a specific clinic providing an aspect of care in an innovative and effective manner, we like to share these kinds of things with other clinics. Sometimes we share them in the moment during a site visit, and other times we do research after a visit and see if we can locate something pertinent for a given clinic. But knowledge sharing is key to what we do. Uh, another benefit is technical assistance. So one of the uh, really cool things about the PCPCH program, in my opinion, is the technical assistance that is available after a visit. We don't just show up at your clinic, tell you what to fix, and then disappear. So we are available to help you up to six months after a visit, and technical assistance can range from something as simple as getting clarity on specific measures to seeing if we have real-life examples of templates or workflows being used by other sites. Or we can also include assistance as in-depth as talking or meeting with a practice coach or the clinical transformation consultant from your site visit regarding more focused work. Uh, it's totally up to you and we're happy to help however we can. And then one last benefit I'd like to mention is networking. Um, so clinics that are on this journey are not alone. There are other teams on the same journey of improving primary care and participating in the PCPCH program is a way to find out who these other folks are, what they are up to, and how to connect with them regarding your own goals. So sometimes we at the PCPCH team are actively involved in facilitating these connections, and other times they just happen organically. Okay. 
And then one last thing I did want to touch on is um, some resources for you. And these are for just general guidance and learning more about our program. In particular, I would like to mention the second bullet point down. This is a link to a series of online modules that discuss the core attributes and standards in depth. Uh, one of the things I like about this, I, uh, I don't know if I'm ratting myself out, but I get super bored a lot of times when I'm watching um, online learning modules. So I actually found this one really thorough but easy to follow and it kept my attention. So there, it's, it's broken down into small digestible parts uh, and I really appreciated um, watching this one myself actually. And so also for those of you who want to know more detail about the nature of a site visit, there's actually a webinar devoted entirely to this topic um, at the Patient-Centered Primary Care Institute website. And that is, um, is there a website up there? There it is, pcpci.org, the top one. So if you go there and you look up a webinar, it's called PCPCH Site Visits, What to Expect. It covers more of the logistics and processes of pre, during, and after a site visit. You will also learn more about the rest of the PCPCH team. And the webinar, one of the, the neat things about the webinar and the site visits, it, it actually includes discussion from a site, uh, from staff members of the site we visited a few months back. And so they share their thoughts on how the whole process was for them. And the last point on the slide is our program contact information. And so we are happy to answer any questions you have if you reach out to us that way. So that is my presentation for now, and that's what I wanted to share with you. So I would like to open it up to any questions you might have at this point. Uh, I have a question. This is Karen from the State Program Office. I know that online you can look up and see who is PCPCH. Correct. Is there a place online to find out who has what tier level? No, that's a good question. I would have to um, look at that again. Um, I can get back to you on that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I have a second question. Sure. Um, if a main clinic has PCPCH status, can they advertise themselves if they have like a satellite clinic um, as PCPCH and use forms and whatnot that describe that they have PCPCH status? Oh, good question. So are you asking if if one site itself, like kind of the mothership, mm -hmm. is PCPCH recognized, can they say that about the other sites? Right. Um, the answer to that's no. Uh, we do go on a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, and that's a great question because it's not the first time something similar has come up to that. Um, but we do go on a site-by-site -site basis, even if there's a system level structure. Right. Yep. So for the folks on the, the webinar online, um, if you have anything, I know people are at different places with um, PCPCH recognition, but if there's anything specific that you've been trying to work through or um, things that have come up um, as a SBHC specifically, um, this is a great opportunity to ask uh, Chris any of those questions. And for those of you who are shy, um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions as well if you want on a phone or email, and I'd be happy to do that as well. And I'll, I'll give um, Kate O'Donnell my contact information too. Or if you're just not thinking of anything right now, that's okay too. So, uh, especially if you're analytical, right, you're going to think of a question 10 minutes from now. So, uh, But I'm happy to answer any time, and also our program contact information is on our website. You answered everyone's questions. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thanks, Chris, for sharing um, some information with us about your program. And um, for folks on the webinar, we will be recording this and having it available on the School Based Health Center State Program Office website. Um, check back in a few weeks. Um, we will have that video posted and a copy of Chris's slides as well. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.